and thank you for joining us for the second webinar in our spring series brought to you by the EdTech faculty at Canisius College. My name is Lauren and I am the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have using the Q&A box on your screen. We'll also save some time at the end to answer any additional questions. Now I'll hand it over to Rob so we can get started. Hey everybody and good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today here. I know a lot of people are at home since we're having this uh, extended outage with the, uh, the, the virus, but we won't make this webinar all about that. It's kind of about that because what I was originally going to present was ways to go paperless. Now you truly have to go paperless if you're not collecting documents from your students. But I wanted to show you how to make online type of tests where we can eliminate the Scantron machine. We can eliminate kids waiting to get their scores back. So there's a lot of nitty gritty details. I'm gonna give you that high level overview today, show you where a lot of the buttons are on these tools. Uh, but again, there's a lot more to dig into. So let me take you on a, a tour here of a couple of websites I have pinned for us to look at. First off is I wanna mention, of course, Canisius. We're sponsoring the webinar here from Canisius and myself and two others are uh, professors in the EdTech program. So you're seeing on the screen here the required courses that you would take. These are all eight week courses, fully done online. A lot of our students happen to be from inside and outside of New York State because they're all eight week courses online. And you could go for the full masters or just the first four courses for an advanced certificate. So I urge you to take a look if you know you or somebody else is looking for uh, information on a master's program that's fully online. Uh, you can take a look at this website here, which is the canisius.edu. All right, on to the next one I want to show you. How many of us buy a vehicle and we have the owner's manual sitting in the glove box and we never look at it? All right. I used to be guilty of that, too. The reason why I'm making that analogy here is this is the owner's manual on your screen for Google Classroom. It has the nitty gritty details about every single little button and feature. Now, I know reading owner's manuals might not be you know, a fun thing to do, but I implore you to please take a look at this because here's chapter one, exploring Google Classroom. What we're gonna talk about today has to do with assignments. So if I jump to that chapter and I look for it right here, creating a quiz assignment, that's what we're gonna dig in deep on today. There's a lot of things I can't show you today though because I don't have a classroom of 20 some students with me now that are taking the test. So I'm gonna show you the initial steps to make your quiz, but as far as grading it, uh, you're going to have to look in here to see how you can uh, view by question, by individual, and the ways you can grade things with uh, numerical scores and also with rubrics, which is great. So I wanted to point that out to you here. This is the owner's manual for Google Classroom. You would simply start at the website support.google.com, and then from there you'll be able to navigate to Google Classroom. The next tab I want to show you is the Teacher Center for Google for Education. They call these the first day approach. Now, since we had this extended outage and a lot of our teachers are for the very first time becoming an online teacher, this is the place I like to send people to go to look at video tutorials, to just sit back and watch other educators go through the steps of preparing these tools, deploying them out to kids, and then how to use them on a back and forth basis. So the screen I have up here is Teacher Center dot with Google dot com and then from there it's first day trainings the one I'm showing you here brings you to the basics so if you've never really dabbled around with Google Classroom this is where it would be a great place to start looking at a couple of uh, video tutorials then after that they have some tricks and this is what I'll be covering today which is uh, how to create a quiz form from Google Classroom these are all shareable so you can share these out easily to colleagues as well so feel free to use this site as a reference for when you're dabbling into Google Classroom and or Google Forms so now here we go into Google Classroom I've created a class for us to use today, just called it a sample class, and I have one student enrolled in it just to show you what it looks like from a student point of view. But if I go into here and I go into my classwork tab, I've prepared two different quiz types. I'll start with quiz number one here. The, I call it the Scantron style. Let me show you the finished result, kind of like a cooking show where we show you the end result first and then we take it backwards and show you how we got there. What you're seeing on the screen now is an example of a digital Scantron bubble sheet, if you will. But of course, no, do, uh, no number two pencils, no having to wait to get paper scanned and turned back. It's just all instantaneous. So the workflow for this is I showed this to my teachers that already have paper-based uh, quizzes ready to go. You know, they've been maybe using them for a while or just a packet of papers, multiple choice, fill in the blank, true, false, et cetera. And 
they would give out a Scantron sheet where the kids would bubble things in. All right, that's the traditional way of doing this. Now, by making a digital Scantron sheet behind the scenes here, each question row already has the right choice designated. So when the student is done, you know, filling in all their answer choices, they get the on the spot assessment grade right there. And you could even reveal to them if they got it wrong, which one is the right answer. You don't have to do that. And in some cases like now when students are taking your quizzes at different times, you might not want to reveal the right answers, but minimally let them know what percentage they you know, got right or wrong. So I'm gonna show you those today too. So now let's take it back and figure out how did I make this form? And then after this, I'm gonna be showing you how to do the um, full blown effect where you're actually gonna be having um, uh, the questions and the answer choices put in there. But this is what I call the skeletal effect. This is just for those that are doing a hybrid approach of still paper-based questions, yet you're looking at it on a sheet of paper, but digital form to put in your answers. So because I am the owner, notice in the bottom right-hand corner, I have the little pencil icon, all right? That's important. Don't think students are gonna see that, they're not. Only me, the owner of this quiz, sees that. So when I click on that, it brings me to the place where I can add additional questions. All right, so what I wanna do is start from scratch here and totally make this uh, from the beginning so you can kind of watch that workflow uh, to start. So I started here in the classwork area inside of Google Classroom. The big button up top here that says create, this is where we go to create all the various things that we're making for our students to do or to look at in Google Classroom. The third one down says quiz assignment. So we're gonna make sure we choose quiz assignment. We're going to give it a title. I'll just call this sample. And we of course can put in instructions which are optional. So feel free to type in instructions if need be. I see a lot of teachers just leave that empty because the idea is that the kids are going here on a routine basis and they know what to look for so you don't have to put a optional instructions in. Now notice that it put this in for me automatically. I did not have to go to add or create. By just by the very nature of me selecting a quiz assignment, it put in this row, and that's important. You do wanna stick with that if you're starting from scratch. Um, if you're recycling one from a previous class or previous year, then yes, you would go to add, and you would add one in from Google Drive. But in this case, I'm starting from scratch, so I'm gonna leave that there. This is an important thing to distinguish, locked mode on Chromebooks. Now, if you've never used this before, it only applies and if I hover over that, it'll show it. It'll only apply if the district is issuing out Chromebooks, okay? If a student's using their own mobile device, because you can use a cell phone, you can use an iPad, you can use a personal laptop, but the key piece here is if you wanna use this locked mode on Chromebooks, it's great, it works really well. It locks down the Chromebook so that it goes full screen, the student cannot browse to other tabs, they can't Google the answers, they can't play music in the background, you know, they can't chat with each other, it just totally locks it down. However, there's the caveat. It has to be a district issued Chromebook. And so if I were to flip this on, and right now with my students being all over the, the county, some of them might be using their own personal devices. And if they do, they're not gonna be allowed to take this quiz because it's gonna force them to say, you must use your student Chromebook issued by your school. So in a normal situation where we don't have this outage and kids are in front of us in classrooms, I would say to use that. But now because kids are using a variety of different devices, I would say don't use it. It's kind of a, you know, a catch-22. You have to figure out when is the right time to or not to use that. So that being said, let's go down to the next piece, bottom left corner, the grade import feature. It's on by default. I would leave it on because what that means is by flipping it on, students can take the quiz once. That means they can't repeat it. It also brings in the scores into Google Classroom. It collects their email addresses and restricts to only users in your domain. So you can't use like a personal account to, to see this quiz. So my suggestion always is to have that turned on. It makes sense that it's on by default. All right, so that's the left-hand side. Now if I go over to the right-hand side, this is more of the logistical stuff. So who's this for? It's for this class. If I had multiple classes I'm teaching, like period one, period five, period nine, you could check them here so that it does you know, conveniently save you some time so you can post it once and it goes to all your classes if need be. I'm gonna leave it as all students. Right now I just have one in there. And most likely you're gonna do all, but if this is a, a retest for only some kids to do, you have that ability to assign it to some and not all. The point value does default to 100. I'm gonna show you when you put in your individual questions, you can change that. 
due date is up to you if you put one in you don't have to and the topic topic is kind of like folders or labels just to keep things more organized so let's say i was doing one here on uh this is my unit three tied to that i can put that in so that it is going to tie it to unit three or whatever the case may be don't worry about rubrics and don't worry about originality reports these are more for uh let's say essay based assignments or slideshows the kids might make doesn't really apply in this case when we're doing a quiz or a test. So I am now ready to create that when I hit assign. Now what did I do? I just assigned an empty test. Makes no sense when the kids see it because it's going to be a blank shell. So I want, I just wanted to do that so I could show you that you can come back to it right after you post it. A lot of times people run into trouble with this. They say, how do I get back to what I just made? Well, remember I called it unit three. That made it convenient for me on the left-hand side here to get to just the things in unit three. But whenever you see three dots inside of a lot of Google tools, that means more. There's more things hidden behind that, usually for the teacher, not so much for the kids. So I'm gonna go back and edit this again, pulls it back to the mode you saw we were just in. And now I can truly go ahead and make this blank quiz look like a Scantron sheet. Now, one thing I like to notice right off the bat here, and this is what confuses teachers. You see this and you're like, how come I can't click? I can't edit anything. It, it's treating me like I'm a student in this class. Remember the trick I said a couple minutes ago, bottom right hand corner, you're going to look for that little pencil icon and the pencil icon will then allow you to go to the editing area. Remember only the teacher can go to the editing area. So the little pencil icon is just for the teachers. All right. Now I don't know why, but in, I find you have to put the name of the quiz in two places. So I'll call this quiz number four. I'll also click up here and type in the same thing. I usually thought it copies it to one or the other, but in many cases, I don't see it doesn't. A form description is optional. You could put, uh, hello students and welcome to my quiz number four, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that. But here's the real important part. We're now going to make it look like a Scantron. Multiple choice always ends up going by default. All right, we're gonna change that though to the option that's called the multiple choice grid. And if you look at it, it kind of looks like a number two pencil bubble sheet as it is. Now this, this gets a little confusing. You're dealing with rows and you're dealing with columns. So imagine what a Scantron sheet looks like. The rows usually say something like question, I like to abbreviate and put Q1 and Q2 and Q3 and so forth. I would just keep going down the row, all right? For the columns now, this would be your choices. So some of you do A, B, C, D. Some do choice one, two, three, four. However you're going to do it, I'm just going to pretend that I'm using letters instead of numbers. And let's even say that we have choice E. Let me move myself out of the way here. And we're gonna go add column, column E. Now at any time, if you wanna see what it looks like, cause I just did a lot of work here and it'd be important to see, am I on the right track? Am I doing this the right way? You look for that little eyeball symbol in the upper right hand corner. The eyeball symbol is where you can preview what's going on. Notice that it opened in a new tab as well. All right, so, so far so good. I'm happy with what I see. Although untitled question, I don't really want that to be there. So watch what I'll do is I'll just change it here and I'll say, uh, I'll just repeat the name of the quiz itself. So now we'll use the eyeball and it just says quiz four and there it is. We're not done yet. Looks like we've, you know, on the right track here, but we forgot the most important step, which is put in the answer key. So bottom left-hand corner of the interface, it does say in blue, answer key. I'm going to give each one of these, I'm gonna make these one point each. So notice that you can change the number of points and you can even put decimals in there too if you wanted to. So this is my answer key. Let's say question one is A, next one is C, next one is B. And I'll hit done. So for me on the teacher view, I get to see uh, that there is an answer key with three points in it. But when it comes time to see it, for the student view, they don't, obviously. All they see is this empty form and they can make their choices as they go. So that is pretty much what it takes to create a skeletal view, a Scantron type uh, form. One thing I would suggest that you do flip on at the bottom is require a response in each row. That means that the students cannot leave anything blank. And I'm thinking might as well put an answer in even if you don't know because there's a chance you could get it right. If you believe in that philosophy then yes go ahead and flip that switch onwards. Okay so there is no save button. A lot of times people say okay I'm all done. Where's the save button? It's not that. Send means something else and it's actually not applicable here so I wish they would 
not have that at this point, but I can safely just close the tab, believe it or not. And you're like, oh my gosh, did I lose it? You didn't lose it, it's still here. So if I close this screen and get back to it here now, and in classwork, looking at unit three, there is my quiz that I've created. So it is ready for the students in the class to take it. Um, so that is what I have. If there's any questions along the way, do feel free to put them in the chat box because I know Lauren is monitoring that. I'm about halfway now with showing you the first style of quiz. The next one I'm going to show you is a little bit more advanced. So I want to make sure we answer question. any questions. Yes, go ahead, Lauren. So when you're talking um, back about Chromebooks, um, were you talking about student Chromebook or student account? So if a student logs onto their personal Chromebook using their school account, does it still work? That would work because it's tied to the login. So even if the hardware, oh, let me think though, if a student has their own Chromebook, that's, um, we've never used it that way. We've always had it where a student has a school district issued Chromebook, log in with their school credentials and it works. I don't think we've tried that yet, where if a student has a personally owned Chromebook, but they're still logging in with their school credentials. I'm leaning to think it would work because the privileges follow the login. That's what truly defines the policies, uh, but I can't be 100% sure on that. Okay, a couple other questions are coming through. Um, because you are sending this through Classroom, you don't need any student identifier field in the quiz itself? That's correct. You don't have to put a field for, you know, what's your first name, anything like that. Because if you remember when I was in editing that quiz, uh, actually, no, that's not where I wanted. It was in the edit area. The important part is that switch right there. When that switch for grade import is on, that will capture the email address automatically and restrict them to taking it just once. So that is the important part by having that piece on. If I already created a Google form, can I upload it as a quiz? Yes, you could do that. Um, the way you would do that, if I go to classwork, create, quiz assignment again, even though it gives me one, a blank one it gives me, I can hit the X here to get rid of it. And then I can go to add and I would go to Google Drive and then I would go locate that uh, form, that the quiz form. Then when you have it in, it's important then to make sure it is a quiz. Uh, let me do this. I think it'll let me pull that one back in. Once it's in and you open it, the important part is gonna be that you go up here to the gear icon and then in the quiz area this is where it gives all those special settings like that switch making it a quiz um, releasing grades yeah this is a good actually time to mention this um, respondents what they can see at the end they're all checked and i'm going to be showing you this there are times where you don't want the students to see the correct answers because maybe one kid takes his test at 9 a.m the next kid takes it at 11 a.m the next kid takes it at 4 p.m they're taking it at different times. You don't want to reveal your answer key just yet. So unchecking that is a helpful thing. You might even uncheck that, which means they don't get to see which questions are wrong. Um, but I definitely think people should uncheck correct answers until everyone has taken the test. Then it's safe, safe to check it back again. And again, that's found under the, um, excuse me, under the gear icon up top. Can you make it so they receive the answers like a week or so after the assignment is due? Yes, you can. So you would do that by assuming you had responses here, you would release the responses. Um, let me go back to the gear icon here. It is under the quiz tab. It is that. So the default is here immediately after each submission. If a teacher wanted to not do it immediately, check that box to later after manual review. That means that the teacher has to then release the scores back to the students all in one shot. And they would be able to do that from within Google Classroom. Let's see if I have that here to show. Let me go to my all topics. And the one that I made called this one, because I did have a student take it. I'm going to go into the response area. Yes, and I have the one response. So the one student that took this test um, does not know their score yet. And in order to release those scores, you would be doing that from within Google Classroom in your, uh, let me go to it here, where it says turned in and assigned. It'll show you the total number that have turned in, which means they took it. Turned in really means took it. When you click on that, 
the return area is up here. So you can see right now it's not uh, released yet. I would check the box and I would be able to hit return and then whatever score is here would go out to the students. And again, there's a lot of intricate pieces here that I'm unable to show you because we don't have actual results, but I encourage you to take a look at the owner's manual, again at support.google.com, and the piece you would be going for is the one that says uh, create a quiz assignment, how to create it, and then for releasing it, there is another section in here, I'm probably just missing it, but it shows about how when you release scores, um, how to do so so they're not immediate. I do to say most teachers like to have it be immediate, but that's usually when kids are with you and they're all taking the test at the same time. Now with these unprecedented times, you might want to selectively release stuff later. So again, take a look at that owner's manual to see what your options could be. Someone wanted to let us know that for Chromebooks, it still works as long as they're logged in with their school Google account. Very another, good. Another question, is there a way to include test modifications such as test read in a Google form quiz? I tried using different extensions with limited success. Thoughts? Okay, I would suggest the built-in, and it's too bad I'm not on a Chromebook at the moment. If I was on a Chromebook, I'd be able to show you. It's built-in, it's called text-to-speech. Uh, it's found in the bottom right-hand corner. You would go to the accessibility area, and by turning it on, you would have the ability to do things like this. You would highlight text, and then you would press two keys on your keyboard, and it would read aloud the words that you have highlighted. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is by turning it on, in the bottom corner, there's a little button you would press down by the time. And once I, imagine I click that right now, I click that, now I could hover over any words and I could click on that and then it would start reading the sentence of where I clicked on. And so that is found in the accessibility area, it's called text to speech and it's baked right into the Chrome operating system. So you don't have to install any separate extensions or you know, on whitelist or blacklist anything, it's just automatically baked right into Chrome. So that is, a uh, a separate piece. Um, maybe if uh, at the end here, if we had some time, I can go and uh, do a Google search and see if I can get some screenshots of it. Um, when you uploaded your Google form as a quiz, um, mm -hmm. can you also put an answer key in at that point? Yes, you can. Once you make it a quiz, which is the secret sauce to that is again, going to that icon, going to quizzes and flipping that switch on. When it is a quiz, now what you're going to see within each question is this in the bottom corner. It'll say answer key. And that's where you go in and you choose which one is the correct answer. Hit done. And now I have a little green check mark that shows me, the teacher, that the answers are in there. So that's why you have to go up to the settings area and make it a quiz because it makes that show up as answer key as an option. If you wanted to send a quiz out during this extended break, do you have to set up a time frame? Uh, no, you do not. It can be something that you, when you create it, you will have the option. I need that to light up. There you go. Up in the upper right hand corner, a sign means it would go out immediately right now. But let's say we wanted to schedule it for some time in the future, like tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. You can use schedule and it'll prompt you then for a date and a time so that it comes to life in the future. Um, and the third option you have is save draft. So maybe I'm working on this, but I'm you know, going to go have dinner and I'm come back later and work on it. You can just save draft so that you can resume where you left off later. So those are kind of your three options that show up here on the little drop down carrot next to the word assign. Okay, last and if you question. make a mistake like, oh, yep, I was gonna say, if you make a mistake like I just did, no big deal. Remember, I, if you don't want something there, three dots, delete, and it's gone. Okay, last question for right now. How can I remotely create an email address for my students? Remotely create an email address. I don't think you can. Your IT, like I'm the IT person for the Oakfield School District. We create student accounts and staff accounts. So that would be something that your school district administrators would do for the students. I wouldn't suggest having the students create a personal account because a personal account won't interface here with a school district platform. So it, that is something that the teacher themselves can't do. They have to most likely open up a help ticket and have their, their IT staff do that. All right, so if that's it, we're gonna move on to our next piece here, which is the full-fledged 
approach to taking a quiz online. Meaning while I'm the student taking this quiz, I don't have a paper sitting on my desk and not flipping through questions. I truly am staring at the computer screen the entire time because the question choices and the answer choices are all on the screen. Now, as you can imagine, that means more work on the teacher because you're gonna front load your efforts here by typing in all of your questions, putting in your images, you know, graphs, charts, et cetera, and your answer choices. However, keep in mind, because it's digital, once you make it, you have it for life, and you can share it with a colleague, and a colleague can share them with you. So yes, there is some front loading, as there usually is when you digitize something, but then changes you make over the years and months that you reuse it, become much easier because a change on the screen is much easier than a change on a packet that you have to go down to the copy room and make more copies and so forth. So for this, I've already made something for us and I've called this one quiz number two. And I wanna show you the finished result first. So here's what the student sees. I made it uh, the first one, the most common type, which is an objective question, which is just multiple choice. All right, but with multiple choice, there's a 25% chance you could get this right and not know what you're talking about. So I don't really think multiple choice is the best and the only option, but it's the most common, so I made it first. But take a look at my second question. It's a variation of the first. This one I think you really have to know your stuff in order to get this right. It's harder to guess and stumble across the right answer. So it's a fill in the blank, but I did make it so that it grades itself. You might be thinking, how do you do that? What about capital and non-capital letters and misspellings and things like that? So I'm gonna dig into that and I'll show you how I did that. And then I like this one, which is similar to the, uh, the Scantron style, if you will, where it is one question, but there's rows. And in this case, I was doing solids, liquids, and gases. And so I blended in three questions into one panel, if you will. So I'm gonna show you that type of format as well. Now, I don't have any pictures in this, but I do want you to know you can put in uh, images for each choice. You could put in a graph. So the question might say, refer to the chart above of seismographic waves. And according to that, blah, blah, blah. So you can put in pictures and you can even embed in videos. Videos most likely coming off of YouTube or Google Drive. So if they need to watch a video and then answer a question, that's possible too. All right, so I went through a lot of advanced features there. Let me show you now how to make what we were just looking at from scratch. So I'll go to create a quiz assignment, same as I was doing before. I'm going to call this one the advanced quiz number one. All right, instructions are optional. I'm going to use the blank quiz. I'm not going to do locked mode. I am going to flip that on. And in this case, it wasn't on by default. So do take note of that down there for great importing. And then the logistical stuff on the right-hand side here, it's going to be for all students. I'm not going to worry about a due date or a topic. I'll just leave them empty for now. So I have to now click on blank quiz. So I have my blank shell. And I'll show you that first question I had was, uh, what is the state uh, that has the capital of Albany? I think I asked something like that. So, and of course I spelled it wrong. So there we go. Option one is going to be, let's put in Florida. Option two, New York. Option three, California. And for fun, let's do Texas. All right, so the big states, kind of the common ones here that always come to mind when we're comparing educational stuff. So I need to put in the answer key. It's not automatic here for you. Notice I'm not gonna click on these circles. That's a common mis misconception. You're not gonna click on those. You're gonna go right down to answer key. Now you're gonna choose the correct answer. And keep in mind, you could have more than one correct answer. So be careful when you're clicking that you don't click more than one. This is the place too where you're gonna specify how many points. Some teachers have a favorite number of points. I'm just gonna go with three for now. And another advanced feature, you have the ability to add answer feedback. So if they get something wrong, you can put in something to look at. If they get something right, you can put information. There's even a website link you can send people to and even a YouTube video link. So again, really advanced features for those that wanna go in and put in those optional pieces for feedback, you have that ability to do so. So that's my first question type, the most common, the multiple choice. Next up I wanna do is the one that I was showing you before, the one that's really hard to get right by guessing. So Let's say Albany is the capital of what state? Now, this is the important part. I'm gonna change it from multiple choice and I'm gonna move it down to short answer. 
which means it's a wide open uh, piece. Now I do want it to automatically grade. So what I get the option to do here under answer key is put some possible correct answers. That someone could put in NY, but they could also put in New York. They could also put in lowercase New York. Uh, they might also put in New York State or they might capitalize New York State. You see what I'm doing is I'm guessing what I think the students would put in. And all those things I put in, I'm considering those to be acceptable answers. So that means if that's the response they put in, I don't have to touch it. It grades automatically and it treats it as a correct score. If they put in anything else, like spelling mistakes, I will get the option to decide, do I accept it? Maybe I give half credit for it because it's kind of the right answer, but it's spelled wrong use your discretion as a teacher, but you have that ability to, uh, to manually score these as well as automatic scoring. If you do this, mark all their answers as incorrect, that means if they you know, put anything else in, it automatically will get marked wrong. So I tend to not check that box. I let it be there so that I'm, I'm allowing grace. You know, if the student spells it wrong, I might give them credit, but take a half a point off if need be. So now that I have that in there, I can move on to my next question. So I'm gonna add, and this next one is gonna be what I was talking about before, the grid view, all right, that multiple choice grid, like I was showing you a little bit before. Again, we're dealing with columns and rows. So if you imagine I wanna do the solid, liquid, and gas, solid, liquid, and gas for me is gonna be the columns. So I would do it like this. I gotta move this out of the way. Solid, liquid, and gas is our example. And now the rows would be our choices in there. So I think I had, an apple, I had um, orange juice is my liquid, and then as a guess, I think I had oxygen. All right, now I need to put in the answer key. Here's how you do it. When you click on answer key, you get to pick which is which. So apple is a solid, orange juice, liquid, oxygen, gas. And again, you can choose how many points you want for each question just like that. And I hit done. So now it is officially ready. Again, that is on for each question. That means you can't leave a blank. I want them to fill in each one. And so let's use the eyeball approach and see what it looks like to our students. So when they are looking at the quiz, here's their multiple choice, here's their fill in the blank, and here is their uh, grid view like that. And so when they are done, they do have to hit the submit button. If they quit the browser tab, it won't register the results. So as a routine user of this, the kids gotta remember, make sure you hit the submit button. If you don't hit the submit button, it's truly not sending the responses to your teacher to look at. So that's what I do to create it. I can safely close out of that and close out of that and come back over here. And the name didn't change. Again, you saw me change the name before. So if I just hit assign, it is gonna say, Let's see if it takes it. I'm, I'm wondering if it's gonna take it because I did make the change. Um, advanced quiz one. Yeah, I kept it as blank quiz. So you do have to remember to go in and change. And remember you can do that at any time by going back there to edit like that. So that's how you make it. And it is now assigned to our students in the class. And when they look at it, uh, let's see if I go back to here. I wanna show you on the dashboard view of classes, it shows up like this for them. If you're not a Google Classroom user, you might find this to be a handy way. These tiles that the kids look at represent each class that they are a member of. And in that tile, it shows the assignment that they have to do. And this is even a hyperlink, so they can click right on that and it'll take them in. For me, it takes me here. But a student takes them right in to take it. So for convenience purposes, kids can just keep their eyeballs here and see across all their different classes what are the assignments coming up. So Lauren, are there any questions now for us to answer on the more advanced, full-fledged quiz approach? Yes, got a few questions. Okay. Um, first would be, uh, back when you're doing that quiz, can students go back into the quiz later to see which questions they had wrong? That would be if you have it set up to allow them to do that. So when they're done taking it and they submit it, for them, it's gonna show up over here as turned in. So the student can then click on that. And I believe if, let me get to the right spot here. If you left this at the default in the quiz area and you left it as immediately after each and you have all those checked, then yes, they would see their scores. But remember I was suggesting leaving that unchecked until all the kids have finished it, maybe also doing that as well. I don't like doing this so much though, because then it means they don't get to see on the spot their score when they're done. 
you know, if taking a test is a stressful thing, it's kind of nice to immediately see your score, but just hide what the correct answer key is just for security purposes. Does that answer the question, do we think? I think they'll let us know if not. Okay. Uh, another question, when setting questions as teacher reviewable, for example, Albany is a capital of what state, do mm -hmm. students see something to the effect that it's under review or do they see it as incorrect? Uh, if it is, so here's the thing. If the child put in any of my correct answers, it would mark it as correct. They would know they got it right. But if the child puts something else in there, like new Y-A-R-K and spelled it wrong, it would still say pending. They would not see a correct or incorrect. It's still pending, uh, needing teacher review. So it, it's kind of a hybrid approach. It's a type of question that does grade itself unless it is not one of the possible choices. And here's a neat thing too, I'll use a Spanish teacher as an example, because in Spanish, the kids will typically spell things wrong, but they kind of have the right idea behind what they put in. The teacher had about 25 students in the class, and I'd say about a dozen of them all answered a certain way, um, they, they, they misspelled it the same way. So when the teacher hit the box to say yes, that that spelling is correct, it took it for all 12 students, rather than her having to scroll through each and every one and hit yes for each person that spelled it that way. So like what Google does is it groups together for your convenience, all the similar answers, and then you get to either red X or green check, yes or no, and it'll approve it or deny it for all the kids at once. So. If, if I could only show you what it's like to grade a full class set here, it is very surprising. Teachers are like, wow, that's pretty neat that Google did it that way so that you can uh, save your time when you're grading common mistakes. Is there a way to save quiz results if a student completes only part of the quiz? I don't believe there is because the key piece is at the end, the child does need to hit that submit button. If they don't hit submit, what they've submitted so far is not saved. It's kind of like a, this has to be done in one sitting. So you do want to make sure that it's manageable and not like 85 questions or something, but you know, a manageable chunk because they do have to reach the end and hit submit. Um, another question, our district primarily uses Schoology. However, we also have Google Ed Suite. Can all of these features be built into a standard form, set as a quiz, et cetera, and then be taken either by link or embedded code? It could be, yes. We, we as well are both uh, Schoology and Google uh, G Suite School. If I was doing this in Schoology, I would make the quiz myself. I would then make sure that I've gone to the gear icon and I've manually flipped on that switch to make it a quiz. Some of these other choices might not be there because it's not coming from Google Classroom, but I would think that workflow would work. You would place the link to that, that uh, form in Schoology, in, in the way that they normally would place links in Schoology. So I, I haven't tried it myself, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. The only thing is though, the grades pass back wouldn't work as nicely because the grades would only live here in the responses area in the form, but there's no easy way for the teacher to get them from here out to the students. That's the magic behind Google Classroom. Google Forms dumps its data into Google Classroom and then in my school, Google Classroom dumps it into the student information system. In our case, it is school tool. So there's a nice like transfer between these tools where the teacher never has to manually type in scores any place. They're automatically moved from one place to another by a click of a button. So less, less integrations by using Schoology, but still doable, I would say. Uh, last question here. When will we see our students' responses? Still to come? When would you see your student responses? Um, when you are looking in this area and you to see what has been turned in, which one did I have turned in? This one? You will see a little thumbnail image across the screen of each person that has turned it in. So if you're like during a class period, you could have the screen open and you would know when everybody has turned theirs in because this, uh, these numbers would constantly be changing between who has it assigned and who has turned it in. So this would be like your dashboard. You would look at while the kids are simultaneously taking it. But down here on the left-hand side, also you have the ability to sort by status. So you could say, show me the ones that are not finished at the top of the list and the ones that are finished at the bottom of the list. And that's another way to look at the dashboard view.
Okay, one more question came through. Is there a way to add parents to Google Classroom so they can view their child's grades in Classroom? Also, yes. how might one sync Google Classroom with Schoology? All right, the first question is the easy one. Under the People tab, this is your roster of all the students in your class. So pretend that's the name of an actual student. You should have, if you're, no, I'm saying should, if your IT staff, like that's me in my district, if you've turned it on to allow guardian notifications to be there, you will see this button. By clicking that, you would then type in the email address of the parent. And then the parent simply gets an email, I think it's once a week, uh, that just gives them the information about how their student is doing in that class. So the parent does not need a Google Classroom account. Parent does not even need a Google account or a Gmail account. They just need an email address. And it simply sends out an email address to the, to the parent. Um, so that is configured not only here to put in the actual parent's email address, but over here in the gear icon down at the bottom, right here it is, Guardian Summaries, if that switch is flipped on. And then they have the ability to do that. And then you can even see an example of what it would look like there. So that's kind of a, a roundabout way. It's not really has to do specifically with quizzes, but it's to do with any of the content so that the parents can be up to speed on what's happening inside of here. So now the other part of that question was about syncing with school, Schoology. The two really won't sync together. Uh, you're dealing with two separate platforms. So Google Classroom is one, Schoology is another. They're kind of competing platforms, if you will. The thing that's similar about them is they're both learning management systems. It's a place for teachers to put stuff, for kids to get, kids to turn stuff in, and then both of them can flow into the student uh, information system. Some people use, uh, let's see, PowerSchool, Infinite Campus. We use School Tool. That's you know where the grades go officially, where the grade, uh, where the report cards come from. So the two really don't integrate well together. In Schoology, you could use Google Tools but you're really not using Google Classroom as the tool. You're using like docs, sheets, slides, that kind of thing. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, another question, are you grading by student or by question or either? You could do either. That's a good, good question to bring up there. So when you're looking at this and you're in your quiz area, pencil button down there in the corner, looking at responses, so imagine I had more than one response here. You can switch between summary view, question view, and individual view. So the question view lets you look at specific questions here. So let's say I only want to look at that states of matter question. This would show me how each and every um, student responded to that question. So I can scroll down and see I'm focusing just on my solids, liquids, and gas question only. Or conversely, I want to look at individuals. I want to look at the complete test submission from each person that took it. And this would be how you do that. Here's the drop down list, and this would be a drop down list chronologically of all the people that took it. So it's nice to look by question or by individual. Some people have a preference for either. Those of you that need to print something off, notice you do have a print button right there. So if the student, I needed to print off, say, a response for a parent to look at, I could print off the entire test for that person. And then the default view is summary. Uh, not going to make much sense now with one person, but if I had a whole class in here, it would show the spread of points across. It would show the average, median, and range. And then commonalities among questions. So this might help the teacher decide, you know, did I build that question right or are a lot of students getting it wrong? That can be uh, determined in this area. So any other questions for the good of the order? And I think Lauren did say this will be recorded. So those of you that want to share it out with colleagues, I know I went through a lot, but it's nice to be able to play, pause, and rewind as you're trying these things yourself uh, in Google Classroom. So feel free to re uh, refer back to this video uh, to help you along the way. Give people a couple, couple seconds here if they want to type in some questions. While we're waiting, I got one more thing here too. When you're on the stream, the stream is your chronological flow of everything posted with everybody in the class. 
one nice thing they've done now is in the settings area, you can choose with the stream a um, couple things. One is what level of access do students have? You can make it really restrict to not very restricted. So I see my teachers changing those things all the time. And then also this, if I change it to, instead of condensed, show attachments, now you're gonna see a lot more stuff. Some people like it. If you see what I mean here, this is now, as I scroll through, there's more stuff in there, like all the attachments. But to some people, that's a little bit overwhelming because you're scrolling through looking for something and it's like, I just can't find what I need. So they've moved it now to what they call condensed notifications. So now condensing it compacts it down a little bit so it's a little easier to find stuff. Okay, now we've got a few more questions. Okay. Um, the first is, so I had a form, but as the kids are completing it, it's not saying turned in in Google Classroom. My first inclination there is, was it made through a quiz assignment? Because if it wasn't made that way, it might not be linked appropriately. And that, without having a back and forth in that conversation, it's hard to know. But um, sometimes what I see people do is they'll post it as a material. Materials are kind of things for reference only, but students don't realize that, you know, they're taking this quiz and they think that the scores are going in, but they're not. So if it was put in as a material, instead of a quiz assignment, that might make the difference. Um, we do have a few questions about how you will receive the video for this recording, and we will be emailing it out to everybody who has attended today, so you'll get that by email. Um, another question is, how do you get the quiz to the classroom? Get the quiz to the classroom. So I'm starting with my Google Classroom, the, the appropriate you know class period, if you will, or, or what whichever tile you're using and then it's going to be going to classwork create quiz assignment as long as the students over here are selected under all students all right they will get a notification when they visit google classroom they won't get an email maybe that's what the person's asking is will they get an email i think see i think they do when it gets posted i believe an email goes in and says mr z has assigned you this thing and so just by checking Gmail, they would be aware. But we like to recommend to our students, make sure you look here in the, let me exit out here, look here on the classes view, because anything that's assigned to you is gonna show up here automatically in this tile view. It also, once you're in the class, it will show up under the classwork area as things you need to do. I hope that makes sense. And Joshua, you've got a question? All right, so I see Josh screen at the bottom, but it does say muted. I think, is it spacebar you hold down in Zoom to unmute? Am I unmuted now? There you go. Yep, is. I got you now, Josh. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I misspoke earlier with syncing Google Classroom and Schoology. What I meant mm -hmm. to say was syncing Google Classroom data with School Tool. Is there a way that a teacher could do that, or would I have to go through the IT department through my district? Yep, you'd have to go through the IT department because there was some um, back end things I needed to set up inside of school tool. Uh, that feature was in beta last school year and this year it is full fledged. So um, we were kind of hesitant to have our teachers try it. But now that we've had people use it, they would never turn back. I mean, it's it's a really a great thing because inside the school tool gradebook, there is a uh, blue G at the top center. You simply hit the G button and then it says pick your Google Classroom and you choose it. Then it says pick your assignment and you choose it. And then it says, um, would you like to import, you know, it gives you columns, like what date should it be? What category should it be? What point value should it be? And it just allows you to pull in a new column of scores. And if you do it again, it will overwrite what was there beforehand. So you can always overwrite the old, if like a kid was absent that day and you know they took it you know, when they came back, you can always just keep overwriting that column in School Tool. And School Tool is smart enough not to create a new column, you know, a duplicate by mistake. It recognizes that it's the same thing. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, this one is for Rob or anybody else in uh, in the room. Is anyone having difficulty merging Pearson Realize with Google Classroom? 
Yeah, that one I don't have experience with. That's not a tool that we use, the Pearson tool. It's like a couple, someone said yes already. Um, one other question. I can see 16 kids completed the form, but Google Classroom says only five kids turned it in. Why? Hmm, that has to do with like a linkage thing again. I'm thinking that there's a way to collect. Uh, let me think, how do you collect? Right here, import grades. So I would have them go into Google Classroom and look for this button on the right hand side that says import grades. Because by pressing that, it is gonna go out and hunt for that form. Once it finds it, it will then pull in the scores. So that's kind of your way of like refreshing the screen. Actually, yeah, notice here, it did pull in a seven out of 13. I didn't have that there before. So that is going to be a very pivotal button to look for on the right-hand side is import grades. And you can, every time you do it, it'll pull in the most recent data from that form. Um, can this work for reading comprehension? Can you have a reading passage attached? Hmm, so when you're making a quiz, if you wanted a reading passage, let's see if I put one in here, I would add a new section to do that. I believe it's the bottom piece here. Or is it the text? No, that's title and description. There's a way for you to add a new, oh yeah, when I added a new section, it now gives me, this is what I was thinking of. I could say reading passage number one. And then I would actually type it in down here. You have, you have unlimited text there, you can put it in. So that that's a passage they would see, and then right underneath it would be the question. So I would kind of trick that out. The way I'm doing that is just by making a, uh, a section. Also worth noting too, I should mention this, this is relatively new, import questions. You might have, or your colleagues might have shared with you other quizzes. If you click that button, they're now allowing you to choose previous forms that belong to you. And once you choose one, uh, let's see if I get one that actually has actual stuff in it. You can then say, I want that question from that form. So you can pull in question, like a question bank. You have a question bank of your own stuff as well as stuff shared with you. Um, so that's uh, kind of something I reminded myself when I saw that. But to answer the question about the reading section, reading passage, I would say adding a section would be the way to do that. It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife tool. That's why I think of Google Forms. It's, it can do a lot of stuff if you just know how to use it. And sometimes you can make it do something you didn't think it could just by putting in a picture of something and, or this reading passage idea. It's really very versatile. Are there any other questions for Rob? I think that might be it for now. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, you will be receiving the link to this video by email. So we'll use the email address that you use to register for the webinar today. Uh, we wanna thank Rob for presenting and sharing all of this useful information for us. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. And then be on the lookout for other upcoming webinars in our spring series. So thank you for attending today.